Well, howdy there, Internet people. It's Bo again. Don't worry, you're not watching the wrong channel. Just roll with it. Now we shall transition into the Center for Stateless Society panel. How is everyone? Oh. Hello. <laughs> ah, so, what is... Well, I guess let's start off with productions. Um, for those who have not, who those just tuning in, I am Logan Marie Glitterbomb, she, her. Um, I am a writer and fellow with the Center for Stateless Society and an organizer with uh, Crew Domain and the Green Market Agorist. And yeah. Who wants to go next? Do you want to do you want a popcorn it? All right, well, it's your turn now. You said something. Oh, I said something. Oh, shoot. Introduce yourself. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Eric. Uh, I don't have a specific position in Center for Stateless Society, but uh, I'm affiliated and I, and I work especially around publishing. And uh, I'm a self described logistics gremlin for this podcast, The Homage. Um, I work largely around cooperative food systems, but I'm about to transition into another job working around uh, time banks. And uh, I am an undergrad student pursuing a double major in anthropology and philosophy with specific interest in economic anthropology, anthropology of stateless societies, dialectical philosophy, and feminist philosophy. And I'm going to popcorn to Spooky. <laughs> oh, hey there, everyone. Uh, yep, I am Spooky. I am responsible for making sure that Tanky and Ancon Twitter uh, constantly hates us. Um, yeah, I basically just write stuff sometimes. Uh, similarly, no official position. Uh, yeah, so yeah, that's that's what I do. 
I am an egoist, and if you don't like that, I don't care. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to pass it off to Nathan right now. Um, hello, I'm Nathan. I previously was the Lysander Spooner Research Scholar in Abolitionist Studies at uh, the Center for a Stateless Society, which basically meant I wrote a lot about prison abolition. I've sort of I abandoned that position um, when I went to grad school. I'm currently working on a PhD in economics. Uh, most of what I do in terms of my research relates to the political economy of uh, various things that are supposed to be in some sense related to defense or security, both the state's militarized security apparatus, the warfare state, border militarization, and so on, as well as alternative ways that people can provide defense from the bottom up. So things like the ways in which social movements defend their communities, that sort of stuff. I also do some work on various forms of uh, non-state governance, um, some of which are, you know, forms I'm more sympathetic to than others, but a variety of ways in which people cooperate through means other than centralized state direction. So that's the broad overview of my interests. I haven't been as involved with C4SS lately as I was previously because I'm fairly focused on my graduate studies, but it's still a big part of how I got to where I am. And it's, a, in my view, an important organization for spreading the ideas of anarchism, especially left-wing market anarchism. So thanks so much for having me here. I'm Kevin. Um, I'm a senior fellow commentator and uh, researcher at C4SS. Uh, I'm uh, an anarchist without adjectives, and uh, I focus mostly on issues involving post-capitalist transition, uh, counter economies, commons-based local economies, liberatory technology, new municipalist movements and things of that sort. Solid, solid. Um, so I think our plan was to initially have Kevin and Nathan sort of give a background on um, this history of Center for Stateless Society um, and then jump into um, why each of, of us could, became involved and then uh, uh, open up to questions. I believe that is a schedule. Correct me if I'm wrong. So Kevin and Nathan may Okay. Uh, I was uh, initially contacted uh, about the possibility of a uh, Center for Stateless Society, I think sometime in late 2004, by Brad Spangler, uh, who we found out later did a lot of uh, pretty bad things and cut ties with them, but uh, I don't want to conceal the fact that he was uh, initially involved in it and he he floated the idea of me uh, doing research papers for an organization with that name uh, I didn't uh, hear anything back after that but uh, I believe uh, C4SS started out sometime in 2006 as a blog and uh, Spangler contacted me again after that in December 2008 with the news that they had secured funding for me to do a uh, research paper and one op-ed with, with hopes for further funding in the future if things panned out. So. So I did that, and then uh, in spring of 2009, we started getting more regular funding, and I started writing research papers and um, op-eds on a regular basis. Uh, Roderick Long was also involved. I think uh, the Molinari Institute was originally the parent body of, of C4SS. And uh, everybody that was initially involved in it were people who had known each other from 
Samuel Conkins left libertarian email list. Uh, it was, I'd say the core membership was predominantly left Rothbardian and agorist, although it wasn't monolithically. So I'm, I'm not a Rothbardian or, or agorist myself. Uh, but that was probably the core membership more than anything at, at the, the time. I think it's diversified some since then. Um, and that's uh, I, at some point in the next few years uh, after we cut ties with Spangler. We reorganized as a self-governing collective rather than being uh, a subsidiary of the Molinary Institute. Um, but uh, I think those are the high points as I remember them. Yeah. And so when I joined up, I had already been reading a lot of content from the Center for a Stateless Society. Um, so this was um, this was about six years after uh, Kevin started. Uh, so this this was or about six years after it started. I started writing for C4SS in 2012, whereas the organization started in 2006. So I was an undergraduate student at the time. I had been reading. C4SS material and material from people around the Alliance of the Libertarian Left. So Kevin, as well as Roderick Long, uh, Sheldon Richman, Gary Chartier. Um, I had been reading them and really starting to embrace their ideas for quite a while. And at some point, James Tuttle, who was the who became the coordinating director of C4SS after Brad Spangler, reached out to me because of some comment I made on Facebook. I don't remember what. I think maybe I said something in the mutualism group. And he asked if I might like to write for C4SS. James was a really excellent coordinating director because he would fairly frequently reach out to people to ask them to write. He would see a Facebook post and be like, this could be a good op-ed, right? Just constantly engaging with people on social media to try and get them involved in the center. And at the time, op-eds were the core of what the center was doing. So at the time, a uh, left Rothbardian named Tom Knapp, who now runs an organization called the uh, William Lloyd Garrison Center, I believe, um, was our media coordinator. And so a huge part of what C4SS did at the time was sending, was sending out our op-eds, which at the time and still to this day, we distribute under a zero copyright model because we don't believe in intellectual property. We think it's an illegitimate state granted privilege, a state enforced enclosed monopoly. Um, but on this zero copyright model, Tom Knapp would then send it out to this massive list of newspapers. He had done various press work for political campaigns, especially within third parties, such as the Libertarian Party and the Peace and Freedom Party and such. So he had a large list of news organizations and he would just distribute our op-eds to them. And so a lot of people would read our work who would never have gone to the C4SS site, a lot of people who weren't anarchists. And so you would have things like me saying the state, not Chelsea Manning, is the criminal in the Chelsea Manning trial being read in like the Demi New Mexico headlight. And you'd have these like nationalists who read their local newspaper commenting about what a horrible traitor I am. But, you know, hey, they were reading an anarchist perspective that was saying the state is a fundamentally criminal enterprise. Um, and so at the time, our big strength was media pushes. That has changed as the media landscape has changed, as well as with Tom Knapp leaving the organization. Um, as the media landscape has changed, local newspapers have become less prominent. And we've also branched out into more long form content. So a big part of what C4SS does now consists of things like mutual exchange symposiums, which are essentially these debates among various people around the anarchist and anti-authoritarian spectrum, debating a variety of issues, like what should anti-fascist tactics look like, or what is the relationship between democracy and anarchism, or um, how fundamentally different would a truly free market society be from the current corporate capitalist economy that dominates our world? Uh, what is the role of agorism or agorism, right? These sorts of 
uh, questions. We have these mutual exchange symposiums. These symposiums are initially online debates, um, lead essays followed by response essays over periods of months. And then this turns into books that C4SS publishes and releases. We also have a couple of different podcasts. We have Mutual Exchange Radio hosted by Zach Woodman. Um, I believe uh, Spooky mentioned, or it was it Eric? One, one of you mentioned your role with the Enrages podcast. Um, so there, now we have at least two podcasts coming out of C4SS. So we've really diversified the type of media we do, but we still fundamentally are a refuge for a previously neglected tradition in anarchist thought or collection of traditions in anarchist thought, namely those that are authentically left-wing, interested in opposing all forms of hierarchy and domination, not merely the state, but which have some interest in markets as one form of bottom-up social cooperation that can be part of a project of liberation. And so the overall like through line that that comes from goes through the mutualists of like Proudhon, the American individualist anarchists, Benjamin Tucker, Lysander Spooner, Voltaire Declare, um, the left Rothbardians, so 1960s Rothbard, but then Carl Hess, Carl Oglesby, Samuel Konkin, the agorists and that followed in Konkin's footsteps, and then the mutualist revival that Kevin and Sean Wilbur really um, kicked off. And so it's all of these different strands of thought that have in common a deep dissatisfaction with the fundamentally unequal power relations that characterize our world and a diagnosis of those power relations that says that states are fundamentally exacerbating these power relations, that they are engines of monopolization and privilege and domination, and that um, the... Uh, and that markets, if we truly uh, get rid of the forms of state-granted privilege that uh, pervade them right now, can be one way in which people voluntarily cooperate and coordinate to build a better world. I thought that was a really great sum up, both you and Kevin. Thanks. Um, and then if we want to go through and just sort of talk about where we each individually come from, if that's not too boring to, to folks, um, and then just sort of open up to questions. Like, what do you guys think? Yeah. Guys in a gender neutral sense. <laughs> um, anybody like to go first? I mean, I got involved with the center in 2016, I want to say. And that was just through, I mean, following on Facebook at the time. Um, I very much come from a background of... Um, you know, I, I come from a very standard, you know, left anarchist background of having discovered an info shop, a local info shop in high school and, you know, read a bunch of uh, literature on stuff like the Black Panthers and got involved with Food Not Bombs and joined the IWW in college and like very much your typical kind of income pathway. And I still do, in many ways, see communism as like a decent end, as a decent end goal. I have nothing against that, um, and very much advocate that. But I mean, if you're not trying to get to, I mean, as an anarchist, I believe in a stateless society, and if we're not trying to get to a classless society too, then and and that's really the the. the at its crux, the definition of communism is a stateless, classless society. And I think that Kevin's work really showed me how markets can play a role in achieving that. And looking at the society that we live in in America, 
I think it's super important to not ignore how markets can be utilized for revolutionary potential. And I also realized the more that I read that I wasn't anti-market. And yeah, I don't think I ever considered myself anti-market. I had just never thought about it one way or the other. I just knew I hated capitalism. Uh, you know, that, so that, but once I thought about it, once I read a lot of stuff, it was really a lot of stuff from Center for Stateless Society, um, a lot of Sam Conkin's work, and that whole left agorist side of things. And that still very much influences me to this day. And, you know, yeah, my views of, are constantly developed, obviously. Um, very much and in, still influenced by a lot of writers from C4SS. Um, and it's been cool, too, seeing how much it's just changed in my time, because when I first got involved, y'all were still do y'all were still sending out articles to be published in other you know publications and it was at the tail end of um tom being involved and fun fact uh we actually went to the same church for a while right around that time um but we uh i I ended up joining on Facebook because I was just a fan and I was involved with IWOC, the Incarcerated Workers Organizing Committee of the Industrial Workers of the World, which is also um, hosting a panel tomorrow, um, IWW, not IWOC. Um, and it's going to be, you know, it was something that I realized like all the abolitionist work that y'all have because y'all were looking for like a new book new book ideas to publish i remember there was like some solicitation for that and i suggested the idea of just compiling all the abolitionist works and that we do it under and we still haven't done this by the way actually i forget why i dropped off the project but i got super busy but um, this project that never happened uh, was that we were going to compile all our um, works on police and prison abolition, restorative justice, similar subjects, right? And um, try and make it look on the surface as bland and boring as possible and like make it look like just a not anything radical just like a, a book about law and you know criminal justice systems you know and i forget we came up with a really generic boring sounding name for it and the reason for doing so is that the plan was to try and um, send it to prisoners. And that is how I initially got involved because I was helping IWOC and book for prisoner, books for prisoners and groups like that. And I was like, hell yeah, if y'all do that, we can definitely um, send it off to prisoners through those systems, uh, through those networks. Um, I'm not as directly attached to that right now as I was pre-pandemic and also before our local books for prisoners just disappeared um, <laughs> as things fall apart. Um, but yeah, so that never happened. But early on, I mean, some of my articles got republished from y'all and like I remember when one of my articles was republished in Earth First um, and that was really cool like I missed that and um, but yeah I was just invited to be part of it as, as I was involved with that project and then now I'm doing this and I've seen it kind of 
I, I saw it right in that transition phase. And then um, as we stopped doing, um, like right before we had stopped doing um, the practice, sending it out to other publications. And I really, I've really loved to see, or I've really, I've loved how much I've seen it grow. I mean, the fact that we're branching back into YouTube stuff um, and possibly have plans to take it even further. Uh, the fact that we have four podcasts right now, um, you know, we do still have Mutual Exchange Radio, of course. We have the Enrages, which is a newer podcast. Um, our Patreon exclusive roundtable podcast for, uh, which is the companion to the Mutual Exchange Radio, is now rebranded as its own separate thing called the Out Group. And then the Green Market Agoras podcast just joined the SS network as well. So it's really, really awesome to see what it's become and to be inspired by not only the people who have come before me, but the people who have come after me. I mean, truly. And to see it, this, this center constantly be revitalized and grow and adapt to the times. And it's, it's just amazing. Okay, I guess I'll uh, I'll jump in. Um, at the time I was first contacted, um, pretty much from the beginning of when I started identifying as an anarchist, uh, I'd been a, a Tuckerite individualist, and at the time I was contacted, I'd uh, recently published my first book, Studies in Mutualist Political Economy, which was an attempt to rehabilitate individualist uh, anarchism uh, and the individualist model of market socialism as an economic model uh, and to rehabilitate the labor theory of value and economic models based on the idea of extracting surplus labor or the exploitation of labor as a viable model uh, against both the anarcho-capitalists and anagoric socialists. Um, and most of the stuff I wrote for the first uh, several years at uh, C4SS was from that perspective, uh, gradually over the, the past decade, I um, started having some problems with the idea of identifying as a, a left-wing market anarchist just uh, because uh, I was starting to find the whole idea of any kind of specific organizational template just as a monolithic way of, of envisioning post-capitalist society. Uh, I, I was having problems with, with that, uh, and I started identifying as a, an anarchist without adjectives. Um, I guess I see things more or less the way David Graeber did in celebrating what he called everyday anarchism or baseline communism as it's revealed in just the ordinary practices of carried out by people on an everyday basis um, within the, the confining walls of, of state administrative uh, bureaucracies, capitalist man managerial bureaucracies and so on that actually keep the system going. But I agree with him that uh, basically any form of coordination, whether it's markets or 
commons based peer production, uh, syndicalist federations, uh, moneyless communism and direct production for use, whatever local groups of people agree to among themselves without anyone having a cops or soldiers at their back to enforce their will is, is fine with me. I imagine the in most areas there will be a wide range of different expedients and uh, you know an in, entire basket of different different options just based on what people see working. The, with I also agree with Graver that probably the one thing that won't get off the ground in most areas is uh, some individuals fencing off unused land and claiming property titles to it and then expecting people to work for them for wages. I think in most places people will just uh, tear the fences down and work for themselves and ignore the property titles. But other than that, uh, I think pretty much anything goes. I guess more than anything, just in the last few years, what I've been most interested in and most focused on is uh, models of commons-based economies in the social sector like uh, Massimo D'Angelis writes about and uh, new, new municipalist movements like uh, the ones in Barcelona or, or, or Jackson, Mississippi, that's been my main research focus. But that's, that's about it for me. Um, I'm happy to to, to follow up with that. Um, for uh, So I started publishing uh, at the center in 2017 while I was in high school. I'm also, I'm the, the official baby of uh, Center for Safe. I'm the, uh, yeah, I'm the, I'm the youngest by, by just one year. I beat Spooky just by one year. Um, uh, so for a long time, it's just sort of coming in uh, a coming of age politically, I was very much sort of a bleeding heart libertarian, philosophical anarchist, but it wasn't really until I read Emma Goldman's um, uh, uh, Anarchism and Other Essays, um, uh, Murray Rothbard's For a New Liberty, and then Markets Not Capitalism that I sort of came around to the full idea of anarchism. Then I moved on to sort of reading very much to uh, you know, communistic thinkers like uh, Marx, uh, Kropotkin, uh, Wolf, uh, Bukharin, people like that, and sort of trying to adapt that to my pre-existing ideas about like markets, which was very much informed by markets and capitalism. Uh, and then this all was also influenced heavily by sort of the punk DIY ethics I run in a lot of like punk and hardcore scenes, so that meshed really well. Um, and so I've definitely come around largely through um, Kevin's work. Um, um, I, I could not cite Kevin enough. Um, and uh, through my my friend and uh, my my mentor Chris Scabara, uh, who helped me really think about things dialectically through uh, about capitalism and the state. And so I've come to this very like libertarian market socialism, uh, the very socialistic end of market anarchism, like that Logan. And um, although Kevin does not identify as a market anarchist, but sort of that area of our of the center, but the center spans such a wide range of ideologies and, and ideas. But um, I definitely would consider myself, um, you know, a socialist, uh, even in some idea, uh, in some terms, a communist. And I just think the Center for Civil Society is a great uh, outlet for those kind of thoughts, which are um, not the mainstream for even uh, you know far left politics. Um, so that's sort of how I came around to it. Yeah, I guess with that, I'll just like, let's see. Uh, yep, audio is good. Yeah, so I was on Reddit one time, um, and basically, <laughs> the, and, and it, it does that does come up at some point. I'm not just like fucking <laughs> around. Um, is that, yeah, I've been interested in libertarian ideas, I think since like I was easily like, maybe 17, just sort of becoming a, you know, legal adult or whatnot. So a lot of 
cool stuff sort of happen discursively. Um, and basically, like, I was sort of a Milton Friedman style, ANCAP sympathetic Chicago school, like, kind of effectively, like, you know, the, the perfect, you know, Coke, Bragger U style libertarian. Uh, and then at some point, I realized that rent sucks uh, and isn't justifiable within, like, the things that initially drew me to libertarianism. It's like, you know, you live in a space and pay someone else to not do something. Like, that doesn't, that didn't make sense to me. So I initially started investigating the work, oddly enough, of, you know, someone I would later write about, uh, American Johnson, non-compete, you know, the dreaded vulgar ANCOMs that I uh, started writing about back in June of 2020. Um, and basically it, it took a little while, but once I went on, you know, again, this is where the Reddit part comes in. I went to the complete anarchy subreddit, uh, which I'm now a mod for as if, you know, anyone ever would want to admit that uh, is basically I got into a lot of discussions with people who identified more with the Center for State and Society stuff. And I was sort of tangentially aware of a lot of material from there, but I wasn't what I would call like an avid listener. I think my only exposure was like Charles Johnson's interview with uh, non Servium back when, you know, I don't even think the podcast was a thing. That was one of their first videos. So that really started getting me exposed to the idea that left market anarchists existed. But once I had sort of had a lot of discussions with people, I think some of which would later go on to, um, you know, write and contribute studies like uh, I think railings, uh, you know, scarcity and abundance under anarchism. I think that was mentioned last night, actually. Like we actually had a lot of discussions leading up to that. And that was really cool. And over time, I just realized that the sort of standard anarcho-communist framework didn't really have a lot of great answers and it seemed very inflexible. And that's where like Kevin's work came in and kind of just really like showed me that anarchism is about not exactly like a rigid pluralism, but there's a lot of different experimentation that can happen when you reject the idea of, you know, models like socialism or capitalism as basically things to be maintained usually through the means of, you know, smaller sort of micro states. And just to sort of wrap that up, I guess, like currently I'm basically on the end of identifying as a sort of queer anarchist without adjectives. I know that grammatically doesn't really add up, but I'll be expanding on that. Um, actually at uh, 1 p.m. PST today, where I talk about my uh, piece on queerness and individualism. Sorry for the self plug. I, you know, helped put this together. I feel I'm owed it, but uh, <laughs> That's sort of the long and short of it, I think. Um, yeah, uh, re read our stuff. It, it's pretty good, in my opinion, uh, just all of it. So, yeah, do, do that. I'm your boss now. <laughs> Spooky, you're an egoist. Don't be sorry for self-plugs. Uh, in any <laughs> case... Uh, but it, it, but I, I need to be humble. It pleases me. Oh. oh, well, if it pleases your ego, who am I to tell you otherwise? In any case... <laughs> uh, so I sort of started getting into C4SS in part as a culmination of the different strands of thought that brought me to where I was because starting around fifth or sixth grade at some point during the Bush administration, my main, the main thing I opposed was the religious right trying to tell people what to do with their bodies and uh, trying to impose their religion and entangle it with the state. So I started reading various people who opposed that, and that included ACLU-style progressive liberals, left anarchists, so I, I read Emma Goldman on an atheist website. Um, I started reading Bakunin quotes on an atheist website. I started reading Ayn Rand quotes on that same atheist website, right? And so I, I started reading stuff from people affiliated with the Cato Institute who were critical of things like the drug war and things like sex work prohibition and things like bans on gay marriage. So I was very sure where I stood on social issues. And then I was gradually learning things about these two divergent economic perspectives of sort of the, the broadly left-wing perspectives ranging from progressivism all the way to various forms of socialism, as well as market libertarian perspectives. And I was fairly friendly to both of them because neither of them were saying, well, we're just going to push you around because God told us to. And so 
I was like, okay, all of these seem plausible. I don't know enough about economics to evaluate which of them is right. I identified as a socialist for a while because it seemed like a it seemed like a general um, application of sort of a democratic ethic to society. So I was kind of a sort of vulgar social democrat for a while. Once I read about anarchism, once I read Emma Goldman and started reading also some ANCAPs at the same time, I started thinking, okay, well, a society of generalized non-domination and without the violence of the state seems like an ideal. I just don't know if it can work. So for a while I was, I had anarchism as well. Obviously this is the ideal. I just don't know if I embrace it on a practical level. Um, and so I was reading all these things and then coming from those traditions, when you start to read left-wing market anarchists, that's going to click really well because the things I liked about leftists and the things I liked about libertarians were there. And their arguments also showed a means ends incompatibility with in particular progressive state interventions implemented within the current system, because many progressive state interventions will be captured by corporate interests in order to impose barriers to entry into the market and uphold monopoly privileges for existing incumbent capitalist firms, thereby screwing over both consumers who have fewer options and workers who will have fewer options to strike out on their own or to uh, get hired by other firms that might enter the market. It establishes a monopsony position through which the boss can more effectively exploit workers. And so realizing a means ends incompatibility between reformist forms of progressive statism and uh, leftist ends brought me to a broadly left-wing market anarchist perspective, um, albeit one that didn't emphasize markets all that much when I was starting these things. I thought markets seem fine, but I wasn't super committed to them. So I joined up with C4SS around 2012 when I was involved in a lot of leftist activism in Salt Lake City, Utah. So a lot of stuff around protesting prison profiteers, especially the Management and Training Corporation, which was based in, which is still is based in Utah. Um, so we would protest their executive, Jane Marquardt, who um, was uh, who was fairly active in Democratic Party politics as well as in local LGBT politics. And we would point out, hey, why are you getting these awards and accolades from local liberal Democratic LGBT nonprofits when you literally profit by caging trans women in immigration detention centers where they're being abused and brutalized? Like, that's really messed up. We So I, I wrote a piece called for C4SS called Jane Marquardt, Progressive Prison Profiteer. For a while, all, a huge portion of what I wrote for the center was inspired by what we were working on in local activist projects. The first thing I ever wrote for C4SS was a criticism of the American Legislative Exchange Council. Um, and this was when the American Legislative Exchange Council was about to meet in Salt Lake City. And so I was, it, we were gearing up for protests of them. And then, you know, later when the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations were happening in um, Salt Lake City, I wrote up some stuff about the intellectual property um, provisions within the Trans-Pacific Partnership and how it would secure these state granted patent monopolies in a way that would raise prices of medicine for desperately poor people around the world, right? And so for a while on the ground activism was what was really inspiring my C4SS writing. I eventually found a niche doing mainly writing on prison abolition, started a weekly blog at C4SS called The Weekly Abolitionist. Um, didn't always keep up with it every week. Sometimes I didn't complete the post or whatever. But for the most part, it was a weekly blog. We put out a lot of material. A lot of that will go in the abolition book, which won't take the form that Logan mentioned, but um, it, because it seems like they're going for a less innocuous title now, Total Abolition. I think the main holdup on that end is that I'm supposed to write the intro to that book at J so, as well as someone else. And uh, we're each supposed to write intros and I haven't written that yet. So uh, I won't keep you waiting too long, I hope. But Need to write that up still. Um, and then as I was involved in C4SS more, I kept reading various things about political economy. Uh, unlike some people at the center who have become less committed to markets over time, I arguably became more committed to markets because I read Don Lavoie, whose work on the socialist calculation debate really helped me understand some of the coordinating roles of markets to a better extent than I had previously. This doesn't mean that I reject the various forms of non-market 
voluntary social relations that Kevin talks about. I'm deeply influenced by the work of Eleanor Ostrom, who wrote a lot about the um, forms of social cooperation that can exist beyond markets and states, commons-based governance, open source communities, all these sorts of forms of voluntary social cooperation that are not coordinated through the cash nexus can still be extremely valuable. Um, so I'm not all markets all the time, but I do place a high value on markets as an important way that people can cooperate with one another. Um, and it was actually working with C4SS that was part of how I wound up going to graduate school because Roderick Long organizes panels on left libertarianism at the Association for Private Enterprise Education meetings each year. And I went to appear on one of those panels. We did a panel on Lysander Spooner's legacy. And so I presented on Lys the implications of Lysander Spooner's thought for contemporary prison abolitionist movements. And while there, I met a lot of economists, including some of the economists at the graduate program I'm at now. And so part of why I wound up meeting people who helped get me the information that I needed to learn to realize, oh, I want to go to grad school to study economics um, and who I would want eventually wind up studying with and co-authoring papers with was in part because of connections I made as a result of my work with the center. So uh, it's been really interesting this pathway from the C4SS has always been very integrated in some way with what I'm doing at the time. And it's really compatible with a lot of different ways of advocating freedom. If you're doing street protest type work or building prefigurative political projects through an anarchist scene, you can write about those sorts of things you're learning from that and spread the ideas that you're trying to promote through your activist work to broader audiences by writing about it through C4SS, um, writing about the injustices you're protesting, all these sorts of things. So I did that when I was in college. And eventually that led to me networking with academics who shared our opposition to the state and shared a lot of the analytical frameworks surrounding Ostrom, as well as market process economics and various other forms of political economy, um, uh, meeting various people through my connection with Roderick Long, um, then resulted in me pursuing graduate study. And now I'm doing academic research that is still related to my anarchist principles and values. So there's a lot of different ways that you can be connected to C4SS. And regardless of what you want to do to promote a freer world, I think that C4SS can help. Yeah, and to add on to that, I mean, oh, we're, we host a lot of writing by non-market anarchists too. You know, um, Center for State of the Society is very, very open to a diversity of, uh, of ideas. You know, uh, Peter Geldous has written uh, for the Center. He's a social anarchist. Um, are we? Do we want to open up to questions? Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Let's see what we've got in the, in the chat. We have any questions? Yeah, it's right there on the side. Um, if you look on the right side of the screen, you will see the uh, private chat and a few other options. I see private chat. I don't see anything. And else. do you see the comments as well? I do. That is where it is at. Okay. Let's so, I don't see any questions for us. I do not either. Um, does anybody have any questions? Come on, ask us in the chat. Um, anyways, going once, going twice. I guess, is there any final words that folks wish to give to our audience? It's been fun. Everybody should check us out. Yeah. Um, come to the website, Center for Society, buy from the Counter Economics Store, um, organized by James Tuttle. It's got some great stuff. Some, some of my favorite t-shirts are from uh, Center for State Society. Um, oh, I'm wearing I'm wearing one of ours right now. Oh, well, we no longer uh, have that one, I think, right? Yes, that one is the, the Voltrain Declare is officially sold out. Um, Aw, well, one. I got one. We, we've got <laughs> from a distance, those laurel leaves look like she's flipping twin birds. 
<laughs> that is funny. That should have been the design, honestly. Uh, yeah. No. Next time. I, next time. Right I feel like that plus below it, I have no fear of bugaboos would um, be <laughs> quite the third. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah uh, look out for our upcoming books. We've got um, our edition of um, Field Factories and Workshops uh, by Kaprokin coming out. We've got Defiant Insistence, which is our sort of ode to uh, the late and great David Graeber, Rest in Power. Um, we've got the aforementioned Total Abolition, which is I, I only I didn't realize until now that it's it's sort of an it's been a long um what, what's the word? It, it's been a project that's that's long overdue and so we're looking to put that out and uh and then the property mutual exchange book is going to come out soon so that's that's what we got in the works right now um support us on on Patreon uh, and you get special benefits, maybe even a mug. I'm not really sure how it works. James is in charge of that. Yeah, come write for us. Um, you know, if you want to get involved and do podcasting or video work with us as well, come like reach out. We're looking for all of that. Mm -hmm. um, get involved. This is very, very, very easy to. And I just didn't. I just didn't think about it till someone invited me. And don't be don't be scared. I, the first published piece I ever published was terrible, absolutely terrible. But they, everyone was nice enough to be like, "Yeah, we'll publish it. We'll publish it." It has since been removed. But it's very easy to get involved. It's uh, everyone's so nice, um, and we're not secretly funded by the Koch brothers. Now, just Corey. Just Corey. <laughs> I'm non-secretly funded by the Koch brothers, but that's a whole different issue, and it's not through C4SS. <laughs> Speaking of money, give some to uh, the Logan uh, at the Go Get Funding thing. You should check that out. It's really neat. Uh, yeah. GoGetFunding.com, legal defense for Logan Glitterbond. Yeah. <laughs> There are links in the website. You know, we are raising money for that. I am unfortunately facing legal issues. Um, it's not why we organized this festival. Just ended mm -hmm. up being one of the things that we had to fundraise for with mm -hmm. it. Um, so, yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming, y'all. Um, I guess we're going to transition into our next panel. But y'all are amazing. And... It was amazing having y'all. Hi. Thanks You're so much for having us. Have a wonderful uh, day. You too. Uh -huh.